It's Friday morning, August 6th, and we want to welcome you to Real Talk. It's Ryan Jesperson here with Sarah Hoyles and Samuel Brooks. We've got a great show coming up, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, in just a moment. A Real Talk Roundtable, our Friday tradition on $10 a day child care. Is it actually possible in Canada? Sharon Gregson, Dr. Lise Gotell, and Dr. Susan Prentice will join us. Plus, a ton of your emails today. I make you that promise, Real Talkers. And, of course, <laughs> Trash Talk. Coming up to wrap up our broadcast week. First, let me remind you that this show is presented, you know this, each and every morning by our title sponsor, the team at Bitcoin. Well, a week ago today, they became the first publicly traded Bitcoin ATM company on planet Earth. Our huge congratulations to them. We know it's a big step for a company that has grown exponentially over the past number of years. If you want to learn more about what they do, you can find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Sarah Hoyles is already on top of our hashtag Real Talk RJ. She's keeping an eye. Samuel Brooks taking camera four, so everybody watching us live on YouTube right now can see exactly what's going on in the studio. Have people sniffed us out? Are people on to us already? <laughs> well, live chat on the YouTube live chat. Is Ryan watching the soccer? Well, I no, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, Sarah, and Sam are watching the the women's football. It's, the women's it's soccer. behind me, so it's, it's a lot harder you. It's for me. It's a little bit more yeah. difficult yeah. for you. See, that's why I understand. <laughs> exactly what you're doing you're crazy like a fox sam sam's gonna be taking camera four so you can actually watch it in the reflection you can yep, see there we it. go that's you can, this is my only you way can of see it in our wide game. shot <laughs> we, we know that the majority of you will see this later in the day or you'll be downloading the podcast later in the day or this weekend we thank you so much for that by the way so uh, they'll, they'll know the outcome you're gonna know the outcome so yeah. we're not gonna sit here and talk too much about it but yeah you're right they, they are way look at that christine sinclair the goat the greatest of all time sitting there just just keeping her teammates focused as they're into they're well into extra time we won't spend too much time talking about it but when no i'm not actually i'm not even gonna say that i was about to say something you never know who's superstitious you never you, you never know i heard a i heard a uh, patrick maroon of the tampa bay lightning he was talking about what it was like he was on a podcast just last week talking about what it's like to play for john cooper for their head coach and he's like it's wild because he doesn't care at all about the superstitions of hockey He's like, hockey players are so superstitious. Someone's going, did Ryan just seriously take women's soccer and turn it into a conversation about the Stanley Cup final in 11 seconds? You betcha. I sure did. But this is a bigger picture of sport. And, and Patty Maroon was saying it's wild because Cooper will put things out there into, in, into the atmosphere that they have. He goes, yeah, don't worry about that penalty kill, boys. We're going to score right now coming up on this power play. And he goes, well, geez, you don't say that. Now we have to go do it. And then his coach goes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of the whole point. So coming back, I don't know if, if soccer players, if football players are, are as superstitious. Hockey players are notoriously superstitious. The way they tape their sticks, the way they get dressed, the way they walk into the room, what time their game day nap is, what they eat. I don't know if soccer players are like that as much. But I'll watch my tongue and I'll watch my tone and I'll watch what I say about if and when we will erupt. How about that? <laughs> did I kind of just say it already anyway? I think I did. Anyway... For people, a bunch of people sit there and say, we don't care much about the Olympics. Not really into the Olympics much. And then something like this happens when, well, you, when your country's in a position. You know, like Canada winning men's decathlon yesterday. All of a sudden, everybody in Canada cares about men's decathlon, right? Well, that like, I don't like the Olympics. I think they're totally bogus. Uh, <laughs> How are they bogus? I love the sport aspect. I hate the commercialization and just basically the exploitative right. nature of it. So okay. that's where, and we're also in a pandemic. So I'm like, why the hell are we having Olympics well, right now? There's no fans. Um, fair. Yeah. Anywho, uh, the whole point is now we've got it on the old telly over here. And, and you're so excited. And I'm, huh, women's soccer, like people are watching women's football and, they should. Are, and are stoked about it. Well, I yeah. 100% agree, but I just, it's cool to see everyone be like, 
Because, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, women's sports. They're not as good as sure. men's. Fair enough. Um, yeah. No, some, not some, fair enough. Some, not fair enough. Uh, your point is fair enough, Sarah Hoyles. Oh, okay. Did you really think I was going <laughs> to fair enough? Nobody cares about women's <laughs> sports. Did you really think? I thought you might just want to be like, get into it this morning. So I was I would ready. Say, uh, yeah, right before right before <laughs> our round table with Sharon Gregson, Dr. Lee Scotell and Susan Prentice, Dr. Prentice. Um, uh, women's sports, you could certainly make the argument. And by the way, we do have an infectious disease physician like hanging tight in the bullpen right now going, you guys going to talk to me at some point or what? Um, but uh, women's sports, you, you know, you can cert. Oh, are they getting to penalty kicks now? Oh, this is the worst. You Focus. can't decide. You can't decide a gold, gold medal, medal on penalty kicks. You can't uh, unless we win. Then it's fine. <laughs> then I'm totally okay with it. But I, I think you'd I think you'd find in, in the wide world of sport, you'd find many people consensus would be that some sports, the women are way more entertaining to watch. Tennis is an example that comes to mind. A lot of people say that watching women's tennis is more entertaining. Um, you know, I don't know. I think it just depends on how you're wired, what you look for in sports, et cetera, et cetera. But something like this, like you said, there there are there is a generation of girls. Like from, let's say, from age five and six, you know, some of them would have woken up with their parents today or even gotten up quietly themselves and turned on the TV if they're on the West Coast at five in the morning, right? There are some like families, or I bet you there are some girls' soccer teams right now that are watching this, that these are the names. These women that they're watching right now represent Canada. And, and six or eight or ten years from now, when they are in the same position representing Canada, they're going to look back to the Olympic Games, in 2021 and say that was the moment for me right that was the moment i became inspired you, you you see evidence of that how there are these moments in sport and then 10 years later that next generation comes through right to bring it back to men's hockey they'll call it the gretzky effect where you started seeing kids out of california drafted in the first round about 10 or 15 years after wayne gretzky went to the la kings or you could call it the vince carter effect yeah for Toronto totally. and basketball in Canada. Of course, you had to go and make it about basketball. But I would also think about <laughs> Elizabeth Manley. Mm. I remember watching Elizabeth Manley Ooh. figure skate at the Calgary 88, 88, yeah, 88, 88 Olympics. 88. You know who else I think from there? Karen Percy. <gasps> yes! Yeah. Downhill skiing. Yeah. Yes. Two medal, two bronze, right? I think, if I remember correctly. I mean, Manley, Manley didn't even medal, did she? Yeah, well, yeah, she won the silver. Did she? I yeah. mean, I was... I, I was that so was young. that was those those uh, that was that trio. Uh, I was lucky enough to be there actually. <gasps> Were you? Uh, yeah, I mean, growing up there, right? That's. I promised to Doctor Saxinger we'll get to her. I do. Uh, that was when I met Peter Jennings by fluke on the concourse at the Olympic Saddle Dome. I was 11 years old. My dad was like, "Do you know who this guy is?" You know, he was buying popcorn with his son in line. I think my dad was using me to be able to talk to Peter Jennings. <laughs> I think I went and talked to his son first. And I think my dad kind of went and talked to Peter. And then the next thing you know, next thing you know, I'm watching, you know, ABC World News tonight every single night because I knew that guy, so to speak. Right. Isn't I met that guy. I know that guy. And that's where I got started on storytelling and my fascination with media. The Calgary Olympics were my mm. moment of meeting Peter Jennings and getting interested in journalism and storytelling. But anyway, but that was women's figure skating at that time. That was Katarina Witt, yes. De Debbie Thomas. Remember the American skater and her coach? Famously, they didn't they didn't like her scores, and, and her coach famously plugged his nose like this when they when her scores came up, and that was so controversial. Debbie Thomas's coach, and then of course Elizabeth Manley did an amazing job. Yeah, that iconic photo of her wearing her the cowboy. Hat. Hat, right, yes. the cowboy hat. Oh man! So uh, yeah, we're gonna. Um, I'm just pretending like I'm not watching every single one of these penalty. Do kicks. I need I to go turn me. that television off, young man? Well, I mean, that might be the best thing for, for the quality of this show. Uh, let's get rocking and rolling here. The talk of this week, and not just in Alberta, but across the country, has been Alberta easing or essentially moving on from COVID-related. Restrictions. The province is treating this as an endemic now as opposed to a pandemic. And I would say that it's fair to state that it's had somewhat of a divisive effect on the population. There are people that believe that the government is making the right move. Uh, upon the advice, the government insists of the chief medical officer of health. And there are people that are absolutely outraged 
quite frankly, we're seeing demonstrations in, in Calgary, Red Deer, Edmonton, and other communities online. Our inbox is slammed. Uh, so I can only imagine what the Minister of Health's inbox, what the Premier's inbox looks like. Our uh, goal here and uh, the way that we roll is uh, to endeavor to speak to expert voices that can provide data-driven analysis and provide an informed perspective on what they're seeing. And that includes our next guest, who has been a great friend of this show since inception. She was one of the first to ever appear on Real Talk. Dr. Lenora Saxinger, an infectious disease specialist, uh, whose clinical practice includes HIV, hepatitis C, travel, tropical medicine. She's co-chair of Alberta Health Services Antimicrobial Stewardship Community, and she is kind enough to be joining us on a family vacation halfway across the country from our studio. We sure appreciate it. Welcome back to the show, doctor. It's good to see your face. It's nice to be back. Thank you for having me. So you're you're on vacation, and aside from us, pestering you with emails asking you to come on the show you're probably i would imagine trying to just clear your head and enjoy the fresh air and spend some time outside but if i know anything about you i know you've not <laughs> been able to ignore this story so why don't we start with your assessment of the moves that alberta has made and and generally whether or not you think they're a move in the right direction you know it's kind of funny because i actually took a very i was, I was surprised as anyone i think with the announcement, not because the content was completely out of the blue, but because of the timing. And so I really didn't expect that at this point. And my first impulse was, well, I want to see the modeling. I want to see the data. And unfortunately, the way it all rolled out was that those things weren't available with the announcement. And I think that actually caused a lot of the reaction that we've seen, which is, I mean, I've been trying to stay off social media, but a lot of extreming, well, I wouldn't say the word anxiety, but extreme um, upset and outrage and, um, you know, really questioning where this came from. And so it really seemed to come as a bolt, bolt out of the blue for people. And a lot of people were not in the headspace of thinking that we were going to essentially normalize COVID as one of the diseases that we face. And so, you know, watching that unfold, I really think that uh, my first response was, gosh, we it really would have been good to have a lot more of that information with the announcement, not after the announcement but with the announcement, because people really just saw it as being completely out of left field, when in fact, it really is within the range of things public health people have been talking about over the last while. So that was my first take is, oh goodness, I wish we had more information with this, because I don't really have an opinion yet until I see that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think the health minister yesterday, the provincial health minister, Tyler Shandro, uh, taking some big swipes at the federal health minister, Patty Haidu, believing that that she's out of line, essentially commenting on a province's management of COVID-19. He attributes it to electioneering and says that the prime minister is getting set to, to campaign across the country, which is accurate, that sense. Uh, but, but again, Alberta's health minister doubling down in his tweet and saying, listen, we are making our decision based on the science. We are making our decision based on the evidence. And I see civilian after civilian and medical professional after medical professionals saying, well, then show us the evidence, show us the science. What science are you citing? Obviously, you have more of an awareness than I do about what discussions are among professionals uh, and public health uh, experts across the country. C can you provide some insight into conversations that have been had around taking steps like this? Sure. So, I mean, one of the things that we've observed in other places is that, you know, COVID largely is defanged by vaccination. Um, and that if you have, you know, that the magic number of vaccination is something that's under a lot of discussion and examination right now. But um, if you reach the point of the population where the overall population risk of severe outcomes from COVID is blunted down to the level of other similar diseases, then the risk benefit of continuing with the measures that are in place really becomes questionable. And so to me, it's not necessarily a matter of if we would ever move to this position, but when. And that's where a lot of the conversation has happened. And so if we look ahead to, you know, places that I usually look to when I say, well, what's going to happen to us next? You look at the UK. Um, they had a horrible Delta surge. Like they really had a, a very, very high case rates that were almost as high as the prior surge for them. But their hospitalization numbers did start to increase but not to the same degree. And so that's the kind of calculus that people are looking at on a population basis is, is you know, how many cases will we accept? What do we expect that to um, result in it within the healthcare system? And, you know, what are the resources that are needed for our current measures? And what are the other 
And this I have less of a lens on, but what are the other important things that we're not able to do right now that are important in terms of greater, greater societal good? And so the other piece that I really would like to see coming forward, along with more detail on the modeling and the data, is you know what, what we're going to gain from this in terms of other public health priorities, because there certainly are lots of those. And so you know the risk benefit, I'd like to know what the benefit is as well. And this is, I mean, that's been, that was an interesting uh, element uh, that I won't say it was buried, but it was just a quick reference by Dr. Hinshaw in, in her initial, uh, you might call it an editorial that was released a couple of days ago before her, her webinar last night. We can talk about both of those, but, but she referenced, for example, Al- Alberta's syphilis problem uh you know i don't know if i mean i, I want to be aware of who i'm talking to and what i'm talking about whether or not i use a word like outbreak so i'll call it a syphilis problem and she references as well the the opioid epidemic which has been a huge issue uh in the province of alberta are those the types of things i know that some people have been cynical about that you know suggesting that if alberta walks away from covid restrictions that all of a sudden the government's going to get serious about supervised consumption services i don't foresee that happening but are these the types of things you're talking about when you say the greater public good those are the types of things and then the other piece i think that sometimes we have been losing track of is that the um the measures that are in place and their sustainability is really going to be a challenge in the fall across the board and so i think there's also some pragmatic decisions as well in terms of of what you can and cannot do because we're already seeing a lot more respiratory viruses circulating and under the the measures that we have right now, if we have um, increased respiratory viruses, any adult with a single symptom has to isolate for 10 days or else get tested. And if we have these viruses coming back after being away for a year and a half and they come back really strongly, you might have a, you know, more than like 50 to 100 higher chance of having a non-COVID virus than a COVID virus. And you can easily see that a lot of things, school, workplaces could grind to a really significant halt if everyone's isolating and testing with all of these different things happening. And so I think that that kind of level of pragmatic decision making and scenarios also hasn't really been aired and shared, although I really expect that that's been part of the conversation as well. Like what will life look like in either case? And are, are, is the risk benefit in favor of continuing the same course we're on? And to be clear, I actually don't, having not seen that, I actually don't think I have an opinion on that yet. I would really like to just know more. But looking ahead to the UK, oh, I think my Wi-Fi is slowing down. Um, looking ahead to the UK, they had a surge. It seems to have turned around already. It didn't result in a huge amount of severe disease, which I think is an important thing. They're really trying to get more data on other um, adverse effects of COVID. So people are very concerned about long-term effects and whether you know, allowing a case surge without a hospital surge might actually leave us with a big population of people with ongoing health problems. And that's an important thing to look at. The data that's been coming up more recently is actually reassuring against that being um, a big problem, but it's something that's still in evolution. And so a lot of people might just see this as being potentially premature based on all those factors. Let me... Uh... This feels weird to sprinkle into our interview right in the middle of this, but can I be the first to tell you, and this is a spoiler alert to anybody who's PVR'd the Olympic Games and they're going to be watching this later, just an FYI for everybody, but our enormous and incredibly massive congratulations to the Canadian women's soccer team for winning gold against Sweden in a shootout. I wish I have, I had literally have chills going on my spine right now watching Christine Sinclair hug her teammates. Uh, in my mind, uh, not in my mind, in everybody's mind, one of the greatest Canadian athletes of all time. Uh, this is a team that's come together and Canadian women will now be wearing gold medals after beating Sweden in that final. What an unbelievable game. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, can I, can I, can I just say like in, in layperson's terms, so I'm, you know, I'm seeing this release from the Canadian Pediatric Society. This is the letter, the open letter that was referenced by uh, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, uh, the Federal Health Minister, Patty Haidu. It, it, it talks about how, uh, you know, the pediatricians across Canada, the, the society expressing significant concern over Alberta's recent announcement says the combination of vaccination, widespread testing, isolation, contact tracing, physical distancing, masking have proved essential and effective they say 15% of the population not yet eligible to be vaccinated are value higher than at the peak of the third wave. It's an unnecessary and risky gamble. They urge Alberta to reconsider the lifting of these public health measures. They say protecting our kids, schools, social connections, workplaces is too important to do otherwise. 
and I'm taking a look at Alberta's COVID numbers uh, from yesterday. We're talking about Thursday, August 5th. You know, cases 404, that's an 80% increase over last week's 224. Our values are high, right? Seven-day average is up now 221. That's up 40% from last week. Positivity up to 5.4%, 5.39. They say that over five is considered the threshold for dangerous levels of community spread. I mean, as if I'm teaching you anything, but as a lay person, I'm looking at all these. I'm looking at the fact that Alberta is, if not the lowest, among the lowest vaccinated populations across the country. And I just can't wrap my mind around why it's so important. And maybe I'm asking you, a scientist, to comment on politics. And I apologize for that. But I can't understand, for the life of me, the urgency to be first to reopen when there are so many red flags waving all over the place. Now, I acknowledge that public health professionals are are, are examining data and having conversations about next steps, but I just for the life of me can't understand how it's justifiable in Alberta. I mean, is there any way that you can look at this and, and make the argument that it is? I guess you're asking me to be a devil's advocate when I'm actually not sure myself, but I think the... I think the points that would be raised would be that um, this actually is a significant shift. It's like a philosophical shift away from looking at cases entirely. It's looking at what happens um, in terms of those severe outcomes. And it's focusing not on like the daily numbers that we've all been habituated with anxiety it's really looking at you know what seconds of are people at risk of having um of having severe outcomes and what does with their decision making and so you know the number of cases in this instance is really something i think it's being portrayed as being no longer relevant mm. and what's really relevant is you know what does that actually result in the other thing i really want to make sure people understand as well on the pediatric side is it is true that kids are the largest group now of unvaccinated people and it, when we see case increases they will you know be a large part of those increases because they don't get the very strong benefits of vaccines yet so one of the best ways worldwide that we've seen to protect kids is actually to make sure that all of their adults are vaccinated and in jurisdictions that have, and it's patchy across Alberta, but in places that have high rates of vaccination in adults, that really, really, really cuts the risk in children. And in the U.S., when you look at places that are having surges where they're having, you know, lots of kids getting admitted to hospital just because the sheer numbers of kids being infected in the community, those are communities with very low vaccination rates, like in the 30 and 40 percent. And so I really think we need to look at what their modeling says. Like, what do we actually expect from this? And, um, and then after you see what the science says, there's this whole overlay that happens at a public health and political level about what they think the best interpretation of their, their people's you know, wishes and values are, which is really also very hard in Alberta because we have the most polarized community, um, communities, I guess. And so, so you know, there's the data. And I think that I would say that the current plan is within a range that can be reasonably pot, like con considered by a public health agency, but it's kind of at the outside of that range. And it really is based on a whole bunch of risk calculations that we haven't seen the details about yet. And I think that that was actually a significant issue. I think that that should have been available at the beginning because people got very upset and they got very frightened for their children. And I don't think that's a really good place for us right now, honestly. I think that, that was extremely well said. And, and if it makes you feel any better, I'm typically playing devil's advocate three to five times per show. Uh, I think it's an important element of any conversation. We have this email from Jason. He knew you were coming on the show. He knew Joe Vipond was coming on the show yesterday. I didn't get a chance to ask this to Dr. Joe. He asked me to put this in front of either of you. Um, he said, I, I, he said, I would ask that you have at least one of your guests pick apart a statement. So Joe has, uh, Jason rather has issued a statement and he says, I would, I would ask that a professional take me to task on why I'm wrong or give me the green light if I'm justified. Okay, so here's Jason. He says, I agree that COVID's here to stay and we have to learn to live with it. But it is not the flu. It has not been studied for over 100 years like the flu has. It does not have a wide range of drugs to treat it like the flu does. It does not have vaccinations that a six month old could receive like the flu does. So we can't treat it like the flu. Abandoning 
test, trace, quarantine until we have vaccines for kids under 12 and treatment drugs is madness. And that's not even getting me started on long COVID. I really don't believe there's a long flu. Would you, per Jason's request, go through that and let him know if he's bang on or way off? Well, I mean, I think that there's some statements there that that, you know, kind of intuitively seems supportable. But I guess that the places that I was thinking, well, but um, are that the biggest difference that we see in terms of population burden of, you know, disease and severe illness and death in COVID has always been in adults and people um, who are more vulnerable and especially older adults. And so if you look at the actual stats in kids, um, a lot of kid infection had flown under the radar earlier in the pandemic because they don't have a severe disease. Unlike a lot of other things, and it might be because they've been exposed to more of our other related coronaviruses early in life, and they might have some kind of preformed partial uh, resistance to these viruses. They they are not like the canaries in the coal mine uh, for COVID. Older people are, and the actual burden of disease that's fallen on kids so far has actually been quite low. I think it is very important to highlight that the long COVID story is still in evolution. And to me, that's another one of the risks that's being evaluated in this scenario where you could get a range of opinions. The higher quality data um, that's been coming out more recently, because initially it was not very good quality data, is actually more reassuring than not um, on the question of pediatrics, kids, youth, long COVID. And the other piece that's been moving, I think, is a better appreciation of what the pandemic has meant for kids beyond their personal risk of illness and the burden that that poses as well. So those things I think are all really good places for discussion, but I think that the science and the numbers are not as settled as as might be suggested. Um, And that the body of literature right now around some of those questions is, is also polarized. And so you can find numbers to support extreme positions on either side, which is not the way I usually roll. I usually try to sift through for the better quality stuff and, and withhold judgment in the middle, which is kind of where I'm at with some of the long COVID material right now. Well, and I think that that's where I, I think sincerely like coming from a position of sincerity, I think that's where a lot of people are even in the bigger conversation where they, you know, there's like you said, the, the polarization that's evident here. I think a lot of people are saying, I just want a measured data driven analysis of what's going on. You know, that 90, 99% of the people in the population don't have 15 years of post secondary studying infectious disease. They just don't. We're not equipped to, to read these numbers and charts and graphs and trends. And I think that's also part of the reason why a lot of people are nervous that this really isn't going to be tracked anymore do you think that that losing that i mean how important is that how important is it that this be tracked you know my uh, my initial response was well yes we are going to have to learn how to make covid part of our background reality but during a transition because i'm such a data hound i really do i do dislike the loss of surveillance a lot um I I understand there's probably a bunch of scenarios that have been worked through for that, and I'd like to know more details. But at the moment, I find that something that I really am having trouble contemplating um, is not necessarily tracking what's going on in a more direct way. I I think the pragmatic part of it is, though, that if if they were tracking the numbers with more detail and we were watching the numbers go up and up and up as they did in the UK, it's not clear that that would be the driver of a change in response compared to any indicators of more severe disease and increasing hospitalizations to go with it. And that that relationship between cases and severe severe outcomes has been so weakened by vaccination that in a lot in a lot of places, I mean, most places that had a severe surge most recently with Delta um, and they saw increases in hospitalization, they they had, you know, case rates in the kind of 30, I mean, vaccination rates in the 30 to 50 percent range um, or lower. And that's what we also see in the U.S. And so we are in a bit of a different place. And so we really do need to see the modeling around that. But, yeah, it, it kind of hurts me not to know exactly what's going on in terms of the case rates yeah i agree isn't it interesting by the way i always want to make sure i I drop these types of observations into conversations to make sure that this is on our radar listening to the world health organization as an example encouraging the the richer nations the developed nations so to speak 
to ease up on on some of the the, the secondary shots instead of the boosters as they're calling them, saying we're trying to get developing nations to ten percent vaccinated. That's always such a wake up call to me, isn't it? When we're talking about where we're at and where other countries are at, and realizing that that in some populations ten percent is the benchmark they're trying to get to. Um, you mentioned the Delta variant. I mean, you're an infectious disease specialist. Can you explain to us, like in late in terms we can understand? Because uh, to be honest, it, it sounds scary, doesn't it? Like people say the Delta variant. People go, well, you know, Delta. And then they just say the word and everyone no- nods knowingly Delta. How, how is it different and how different is it? And can you, in, in layperson's terms, can you help us understand the Delta variant? Sure. So, I mean, the Delta variant, um, we expect viruses to change as they travel through populations and across the world. And... Um, you know, there is a, would be a tendency, especially going through a partially vaccinated population um, for viruses to gain, I guess, skills um, that allow them to spread more efficiently. And so this actually happened fairly late in the game for COVID, honestly, um, compared to what you might guess from some other viruses. But the Delta variant is definitely more transmissible. It definitely de- increases the R value or the potential highest R values in terms of the number of people that a single person might infect. Um, fairly markedly. And there's still a lot of work going on trying to figure out why, but it might have to do with how fast and how high the viral levels get in the upper respiratory tract early in infection. And so that might be one of the reasons. And then some other things are being evaluated as well. And so it is, you know, just basically more efficient COVID. Um, There is somewhat conflicting data as to whether or not it's truly a worse infection. Um, you know, in the setting of the Delta surge we saw in the UK, they their mortality rate was less than 10% of what it had been in the previ- previous surge, and that's probably due to vaccination. And so, you know, that would be, you know, our worst case scenario is still, we would expect to be significantly less than the last surge, mm. even our worst case scenario right now. Um, but it does change the game, it changes the math. And so that's why the modeling data that they're planning to release, I understand, is so important because you want to know that that increased transmissibility has been appropriately factored in along with our background vaccination rates to try to say what is our worst case scenario. And it would appear based on this decision that that has been seen as being okay and compared to the you know, compared to not continuing these things or continuing these things, it's been judged to be the better course of action. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions there and a lot of um, risk assessments, I think, that we would we would just like to understand better. Uh, doctor, I'm committed to letting you get back to your vacation. I'll make this the last question. I've, I've been trying to do some reading and educate myself on, and I recognize that this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the very reality of a pandemic is that there are constantly moving targets, obviously from, from public health policies to the research to whatever. I mean, it's, it, it, it's been an, an evolving and moving animal, right? And um, my understanding is that in the debate around airborne transmission, that there's really not settled science here, but it seems to continue to come up in conversation, whether people are talking about, you know, I've seen some 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 parent groups across the country demanding better HVAC in their kids elementary schools. I've seen conversations around uh, N95 masks and healthcare workers. I mean, there's really been a lot. It continues to come back the idea around airborne transmission. Uh, what's your take on that? You know, that's another area of of polarization, I think, that where the polarization is kind of in excess of the available certainty of the data. And and the reason I say that is because we are looking at this again. We've been looking at it fairly continually. And I'm not speaking as a scientific advisory group person, but as, you know, part of my gig has been looking at this information. Um, I, I think that there has been a much better understanding that airborne transmission is a factor in this disease and that had been downplayed early in the pandemic based on experience with other viruses. Um, And our original infection control and masking advice was based mostly on data that we had from influenza, which really didn't show a benefit to higher grades of masking, if that makes sense, even in the community or in the hospital. Um, In the hospital setting, I think that a lot of the information that's come forward that informs, you know, this airborne transmission as being a higher risk is still in a kind of hypothesis generating stage. It hasn't been an observed difference in the real world stage. And so we know a lot more about particles. We know a lot more about filtration. Um, And in general, I'm very pro ventilation for all sorts of health reasons. And so I think that that one is actually one that you can kind of layer as a basic that we should have good quality air um, as something that we can all agree on. Um, The additive benefit of masking and N95 masking is something I think where there's still a lot of work being done. And um, I think 
premature conclusions in that area um, could actually have negative effects as well in terms of the burden on someone's like lived experience in terms of wearing, for example, an N95 mask for eight or 12 hours versus not um, kids and their communication, wearing a mask versus not. And so I do think it's important to keep on talking about it. I do also agree though, in settings of very, very high risk, if there's a possible benefit to doing something, then you really have to look at doing it, even if it's not totally settled yet. And so, you know, at the moment, for example, we're looking at 10 or 20 fold lower infection rates than we had at our last surge around the time that we closed schools. And so we are in a different place right now. And we also, I think, really do need to follow those, you know, the outcomes in kids data from other places as well. But, you know, I, I think that that area is something where it appears as if it's been decided, but in actual fact, there's still a significant amount of work to be done and that the end answer is not here yet. Uh, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, an infectious disease specialist, a co-chair of the Alberta Health Services Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned that we, we, we've received, uh, I would say, more emails in the last 12 hours than per usual, which is saying something because this is an engaged audience if I've ever known one. And I've known engaged audiences. Um, I, I want to read to a couple. We're going to get to our Real Talk Roundtable in a moment, but I, I, I'm going to sprinkle in some commentary through the show today. We received this one from Nancy. Nancy wrote this uh, following Dr. Dina Hinshaw's uh, web available, her webinar, I guess you'd call it, uh, last night, a Thursday night. And uh, Nancy signs off hopeless. Uh, she says, uh, you know, this this webinar w- was long winded and vague, you know, telling Albertans we need to learn to live with COVID-19 as numbers rise significantly is ridiculous. I, I would love to have Dr. Hinshaw explain how this relates to all but eliminating testing, no isolating positive cases, no contact tracing. Nancy says, am I stupid? This makes no sense to me. She says her roundabout answer about COVID-19 not affecting children under 12. I thought Dr. Saxinger had some interesting points to consider. I need to go back and listen to that interview again. Or, or she really made some interesting comments about kids. Because it really, if I were to have one theme, if I were a headline writer for a newspaper back in the day and had to sum up an entire story, an entire movement in one headline, it, w- it would be think of the kids. That's what this is really all about. You know, not to degrade anybody else's perspective, but it's really all that's what most people seem to be most concerned about is the kids, the unvaccinated, the vulnerable. She says that this this assertion appears to be contradicted by serious cases. Now we can see it in several states across the U.S. I mean, including the deaths of young kids, you know, an 11 month old in ICU. uh, CBS News was reporting yesterday. How many deaths are acceptable to this government? I mean, how many would be too many? Nancy says it's not enough that I live with autoimmune disease. That I take drugs with side effects, some of them quite serious. My body can turn on me at the drop of a dime, any body part, any organ. My life scope has been limited due to my disease. And and now I guess my kind are simply collateral damage. We're expendable because we're already sick. I guess I should just be grateful I lived this long. You know, how about this? How about I just get used to being isolated, alone, lonely, and left behind? And yes, I've been double vaccinated. If there's virtually no testing, no isolating in positive cases, no contact tracing, I'll never know who's infected, who's not. Grocery stores, she says, are my only social event of the week. She signs off hopeless. Meantime, we get an email from Dr. Rick Spooner. He says, I just watched Dr. Dina Hinshaw speak for an hour and a half, and the policy decisions... Uh, COVID-19, the Alberta government's moves concerning its approach to the pandemic. She took questions from the audience, which included some of her toughest critics. Dr. Spooner says, Ryan, I I recently emailed you uh, and I suggested that Dr. Hinshaw be given the opportunity to explain her department's decisions before final judgments were made about them. Want to let the good doctor and everybody else know we do have an interview request in with Dr. Dina Hinshaw. He says in in Thursday's availability, she presented lucid, reasoned, evidence-based answers that, in my view, supported her department's position. In marked contradiction, the attacks by her critics seem almost hysterical, with no shortage of doomsday scenarios. In particular, the professional capital punishment verdict, Ryan, rendered by your recent interview subjects, Drs. Mithani, Marklin, and Vipond, looked to be uniformed. 
to put the best possible construction on it. The phrase, I have lost confidence in, says the doctor, is such a pretty euphemism. We say it about politicians and governments all the time, but when you say it about the work that a professional like Dr. Hinshaw does, it really means she's incompetent or not capable of proper judgment and does not have the capacity to carry out the work she was hired to do. It's such a pretty euphemism, just like saying restroom instead of shithouse. I was proud of Dr. Hinshaw tonight, says Dr. Spooner. She is the exact opposite of the malleable yes woman that her critics make her out to be that from dr spooner out of edmonton i appreciate the email you can let me know what you think we're always interested in how our audience is responding to this and what you make of our content who would you like to see on the show whose voice would you like to hear what would you like to see a circle back on what's an angle that we're missing what's an angle that demands to be explored can we show everybody this photo from Friesen Brothers? This, is, this was submitted from an audience member. I really appreciated this from Kirsty. We got this email just the other day to talk at RyanJesperson.com. She says, I wanted to thank Real Talk and the team at Friesen Brothers for this wonderful gift basket. She was one of our winners. You remember a couple of weeks ago we did the barbecue giveaway, the barbecue sauce giveaway? She says, you read my Instagram post on your show, the one about grilling wings? That jumped out at me. I said, everybody talks about barbecue. Very few people talk about barbecue and grilling chicken wings, but they are one of life's great delights. She said, I finally picked up my barbecue prize pack today, and I was blown away by the presentation, the curation of the local products, including fresh watermelon, burgers, kombucha, and of course, the barbecue sauces. I also had a chance to walk through that beautiful South Edmonton store for the first time. It definitely met the high expectations, Ryan, that you had set. <laughs> And she says, and don't worry, I did pick up sourdough cinnamon buns. Thanks for everything you guys are doing at Real Talk. Love listening to you three every day. That from Kirsty. Thank you. And thanks for checking out that store. Friesen Brothers with 16 locations across the province. You know that. You can learn more about them at Friesen.com. Also, a big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. We're really excited to be promoting their I mean, through the month of August, this is a real commitment. This is them putting their money where their mouth is, right? They said we wanted to, in the wake of this devastating story about residential schools, educate ourselves and reach out to friends within Indigenous communities, align ourselves with groups that could use some financial help. That's how they came across the Wakutuin Society. Annual retreats they hold for Indigenous women who are survivors of both cancer and residential schools. These retreats are culturally safe for Indigenous women and allow them an opportunity to heal physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual injuries while empowering people to wellness and strength as community leaders. A dollar from every cone sold at the six Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park for the month of August, the entire month, will go to the Wakutuin Society. This is going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, especially if real talkers like you go and pick up why not pick up cones for your neighbors? Why not pick up cones for the whole family? A dollar from every one of them going to an amazing cause. Well, I know this is a subject that a lot of people are going to care about. And I know that this podcast, this link is going to be shared across the country. I have no doubt. Because once you start talking about affordable child care, whether we're going to call it subsidized child care, affordable child care, whether it's going to be specifically $10 a day, child care, you know that this is an issue that impacts people, millions of people across the country. I'm very excited uh, to have this trio joining us for our Real Talk roundtable today. Sharon Gregson is the provincial spokesperson for the, the very successful $10 a day child care campaign uh, working with the Coalition of Child Care Advocates of British Columbia. Uh, she represents BC on the Board of Child Care, now the Child Care Advocacy Association of Canada. Uh, Dr. Lise Gutell is a professor of women's and gender studies at the University of Alberta, also the associate chair in the Department of Women and Gender Studies. And Dr. Susan Prentice is a professor of sociology at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, where she holds the Duff Roblin Professor of Government, her research focusing on gender and public policy with a specialty in child care. Thrilled that the three of you could join us this morning. I want to encourage you, as we do with our roundtables, to speak freely, to jump in on one another, treat it like we're all out for coffee 
or if I'm being honest this afternoon, white wine on a patio. Let's get real. But uh, but please speak freely. Uh, Sharon, why don't we start with you? I mean, you've been in this game for a long time advocating specifically for ten dollar a day child care. You feeling more encouraged now that the federal government has indicated this is a priority and we're starting to see deals come together? Well, we've never had commitment at this level before. We've had federal governments talk about the priority of child care, talk about recognizing how important it is for the economy and gender equity and children's development. But we've never actually had a government that's put this kind of money on the table before. Maybe that's because for the first time we've got a female federal finance minister. Um, But for sure, we're seeing unprecedented investment. And in BC, we've got a government that's also committed to the $10 a day plan. And so for us in BC, the stars are really aligned and we're holding governments accountable to deliver now. Uh, I know that we'll get into the province by province conversation, the sort of jurisdictional implications. Uh, Dr. Prentice, though, you, you do have a bit of a national lens on this. How significant was that announcement back in, in April uh, from Finance Minister Christia Freeland, an investment of about $30 billion over five years to help offset costs of, of early learning and child care services? Well, historic and uh possibly transformational and really unprecedented. Um, But so far, right, it's still aspirations. It's gotta be put on the ground, it's gotta be put in place and the devil as always will be in the details. But I will say as someone who's been working on childcare policy for many decades now, um, it it really was um, a heart lifting moment for all of us across the country to imagine that we have a federal government now that's really willing to take this seriously. Dr. Gotel, so, how have you uh, how have you seen? I mean, what has the evolution of the conversation looked like over the course of your career for as long as you've been paying attention to this? Well, um, I have to say I've been paying attention to it like Susan for for quite some time. Um, so the Royal Commission on the Status of Women in 1970 said that child care, the care of children, is a burden, a responsibility to be shared by men, women, and all of society. And unfortunately, um, we have, uh, until very recently, uh, left the latter part off the table. So um, the care of children, the care of elderly people has been privatized. It's been relegated to unpaid work in family that is most often performed by Women. So this is a, a really radical change in in the approach and in the conversation. Unfortunately, I'm I'm afraid that Alberta is going to be left out of this, and that's very concerning for us in 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 this province. Do you know what? I'm going to be honest with you, Doc, because you and I have spoken many times. I didn't want to just come at you right away with a negative perspective. I wanted to kind of <laughs> try to have some form of optimism be- before I asked you how badly you think people in Alberta are going to get screwed by this, because we we see deals coming around and and i'll invite all three of you but i'll I'll come back to lease first here i mean you know july 8th the federal government reaches an agreement with bc july 13th federal government agreement with nova scotia july 27th pei gets a deal july 28th newfoundland gets a deal and you know we've we've got the premier's comm staff out there saying federal government doesn't even want to deal with us i talked to jim carr the pm special rep for the prairies the other day he says hey i mean both sides have to want to come to the table i mean how concerned are you that politics and, and personal grudges are going to get in the way of four and a half million Albertans seeing a program come together? Well, I think uh, I'm hugely concerned. I think Albertans uh, need to be hugely concerned about this. The rhetoric coming from the provincial government, uh, Rebecca Schultz yesterday, suggests that um, we're being set up to to leave one point one billion dollars in federal money for child care on the table because the UCP doesn't want to agree to the conditions, which, of course, are uh, reducing fees by 50 percent by 2022. Um, uh, uh, committing to an average of $10 a day daycare by 2026, and also support for licensed childcare. They want the money, no conditions. And I think the feds are pretty reluctant to do that, given previous experience with this government mismanaging federal pandemic funds. So it's a big problem. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm past uh, the age of worrying about childcare, and I, I don't have any grandchildren yet. 
But, you know, I remember when as a single parent and a new faculty member at the University of Alberta in a professional job, I was paying more than one third of my take home pay for daycare. And it was really debilitating. I, you know, was falling into debt at the end of every month and as a reasonably well paid professional. So this is a critical issue for all of us. I don't even I don't even know how some families do it. And I can tell right away. They don't, that- Ryan. They don't do it. That's the problem. Yeah. They, they have no choice but to leave licensed child care and mm. seek out unlicensed, unmonitored, often very poor quality, even dangerous child care, because either they cannot get a space, there's only enough child, licensed child care spaces for about 20% of kids in Canada, or they can't afford it. And in Vancouver, for example, we've got fees that are over $2,600 a month for one child for one month. So unless you're ridiculously wealthy, nobody easily writes a check for 2600 bucks a month for one child in, in a child care space. Well, can I so point out the real, can I point out underground. the really obvious, Sharon, is that if you're talking about 2600 a month in Vancouver, can we also point out that it's like 2600 a month in Vancouver to have a 600 square foot apartment? <laughs> exactly. So, so young people have got a double whammy the housing crisis and the childcare crisis, and then the context of the climate crisis. So, you know, we're, we're not doing young people any favors. Childcare is a good investment for children's development, for gender equity, and we all know for the economy. We need more women in the workforce. We need more parents in the workforce. And mm-hmm. childcare is the way to do it. And actually childcare, ECEs, early childhood educators, are the workforce behind the workforce. And mm-hmm. the only way that Canada is going to be able to step out of this pandemic is through this kind of childcare investment. And Susan is quite right. Lots of commitment and the dollars are on paper, but it's got to hit the ground. It's got to be $10 a day to childcare, $200 a month maximum for families. That's real. And it's got to be accompanied by a decent wage grid for early childhood educators, because there's no sense building more childcare spaces if there's nobody to work in them. So we've got to have a decent wage grid, pay educators well, make sure they've got a great education, for the, for the important work of working with the young children, just like elementary school teachers, we expect high quality from them. We should expect it in our early childhood system as well. Dr. Prentice, I can tell you got something to say. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, it's astonishing to me that people still talk about childcare as a dollar, uh, you know, on a daily dollar. Like you never talk about your apartment rent on a per day basis and you never talk about your salary on a per day basis. But sometimes, you know, we think that we should talk about childcare on a per day basis. You know, there are places in Canada where people are paying over $20,000 a year. And so when Lee says it was more than a third of her salary as a young professor, this is really true. In my province, Manitoba, which is the second most affordable province outside of Quebec, the average family that uses childcare and has two kids pays about 22% of their family income for childcare. Like that's a big chunk and that's even at relatively affordable. So I think that $10 a day is a really important interim step, but one day I think childcare will be as it needs to be publicly funded the same way we fund education. But until we get to that point, this is gonna be a game changer for so many parents. Can I ask, you know, one of the things that we, we've covered this a lot and I've had a lot of conversations like this over the years and I, and, and I find I don't want to get back into a rut of asking the same questions that I feel like have already been addressed and they've already been answered. Like, is there economic justification for public support of child care? And everybody's going to say, obviously, we've known that for years. I mean, the, re- the, the return on investment is obvious. So why do you think that there's pushback? I mean, what is it that's standing in the way of people? Re- if you were to say, if we give an oil company company this subsidy or this bursary or this tax break we're guaranteed which is not the case we're guaranteed to see return most people go yeah great perfect or if we give small business this incentive we're guaranteed to see this nobody would complain about it with child it's care patriarchy it's patriarchy and capitalism <laughs> That's what gets in the way well let's go <laughs> patriarchy <laughs> capitalism and colonialism let's uh let's add that yeah. That those are yeah. the stumbling blocks. What what women's work all about? What's the care of children really all about? How do we value children? How do we value women's work inside the home and outside of the home? Those are the stumbling blocks. Sharon, I, I started 
Yeah, go ahead. If I can jump, if I can jump. I started studying childcare during World War II and the fight in Canada to keep it going. And during World War II, children who used childcare were sometimes called by newspapers eight-hour orphans. Like the idea that a child in a childcare setting was an eight-hour orphan. And I think this legacy of thinking that childcare settings are regrettable places for unfortunate children and that really lucky, happy kids and lucky, happy families have a mom at home. This is a very much a class-based model. It's a race-based model. It's very exclusive. It hardly worked for most families and certainly doesn't work for most families now. And yet this belief that really the family and a private mother in a private home is the best and only place for a child, that has deep roots, this belief in private responsibility. It goes really far. It doesn't look like a weird question to say, is there an economic case for childcare? But we hardly ever say, is there an economic case for like the Canada Health Act? Is there an economic case for the RCMP? Is there an economic case for your fire department? And yet the, the question looks normal when we apply it to families because we don't have a political history in Canada of thinking as a family policy as a public responsibility and a public entitlement. It's true. Uh, Sharon, can I circle back? Uh, what does colonialism have to do with it? Well, I think when we look at the First Nations, and, and I am not a First Nations person and don't want to speak in, as if I am, but, you know, a history of or a tradition of a more community-minded approach to raising children. Um, you know, I, I frequently hear the term aunties, so a lot of collective responsibility um, and collective involvement. And our colonial approach is very much, as Susan has described, uh, a, a very isolated mom and dad and 2.2 children um, who really have to look after themselves and childcare being a private responsibility. And, you know, I've uh, you know, been doing childcare advocacy since I was a young mom myself. And I can remember being on TV, um, radio talk shows where somebody would say, you know, uh, you should be taking responsibility for your own kids. And really, just because you're using childcare doesn't mean you're not raising your own children. Quality childcare is an extension of parenting, not a replacement for it. Um, I think, though, that the public attitudes towards childcare have changed over the 30 years I've been doing advocacy. And polling shows that there is more appetite for public investment, recognition that it doesn't actually matter anymore if you're rich or poor or middle class. Everybody has difficulty finding childcare. Everybody has difficulty affording it. Almost everybody. Um, and so there is much more of a collective um, desire to solve the problem. And the 10-a-day plan in BC, which now, you know, the Prime Minister is speaking at podiums, promising 10-a-day childcare, is now across the country. And people are recognizing the value of being concrete about what affordability means. It's not some nebulous term. $200 a month is mostly affordable for families. And for those whom $200 a month isn't, then there's um, mechanisms in place to make it no cost at all. Um, but it only works if it's paired with investment in the educators as well. And I can't stress that enough. So it's always a three-pronged approach. It's about the number of licensed spaces available. It's about the affordability. And it's about having well-educated well-compensated early childhood educators were for children zero to 12, not just three to five-year-olds, but for children zero to 12. We uh, we had almost not an identical conversation, obviously, but uh, talked to a fierce advocate for long term. That doesn't even do her justice uh, for long term care. Yesterday, Dr. Vivian Stamatopoulos, who was who was very uh, insistent on pointing out how important it was to talk about wages, training and oversight for frontline staffers in long term care centers. And, and I think that we need to spend more time uh, talking about that today. Sharon, let me let me just ask you in follow up. So this 10 a day child care plan launched in bc 10 years ago right in 2011 that's right um can that's you right. Can just you... imagine if if governments if governments had listened to us 10 years ago well sure how much further ahead we would be now so you well you've got it you've got the luxury is a weird word but you've got the ability to look back now over the course of a decade which is a pretty decent sample uh to be able to provide us some insight on how it came about and and the impact that it's had can you shine some light on that Right. So being concrete about the solution, concrete about defining affordability, being able to quantify the number of spaces that were required, costing out what government investment needed to be to make it real for government. And then we created the political space for politicians to make good decisions. So we built a movement. Um, 
we we had our allies, but we also had non-traditional allies, chambers of commerce, boards of trade, um, businesses who also said that, yes, this is important uh, investment for government. And so once we had created a movement, it was safe for politicians then to commit to implement the $10 a day plan. And success begets success. And as the child care context got worse and worse, more unaffordable, tragedies happening, children dying in unlicensed childcare, it became easier for government to do the right thing and make the right commitments. Now, that doesn't mean we take the foot off the gas. We have to keep pushing them. And now that we've got the prime minister committing to 10 a day, you know, our advocacy has to continue, particularly if there's going to be a, a federal election. We have to make sure that that doesn't negate all these bilateral agreements and that post-election that we're still on the same road. Yeah, we, we, we heard from Minister Carr there will be a federal election. He just wouldn't tell us what day they're calling it. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, Dr. Gotel, what if we like in the context of COVID, uh, have, have we learned have we, have we come to better appreciate the value of child care? Do you think as a society, has COVID or this pandemic had an impact, do you think, on public understanding and awareness and discussion around this subject? Well, I think that when you have child care being the centerpiece of a federal budget, it's it's pretty strong evidence of, of change. Um, but, you know, the, the pandemic has had really devastating consequences, obviously, which, you know, we all know, um, you know, something like 54,000 Canadian women have left the workforce since this time last year. Um, you know, those of us or those women who were um, lucky enough to be able to stay at home during, you know, the early parts of the pandemic really struggled with, um, you know, balancing uh, their, their work at home and looking after kids. And it, it really did cause a lot of uh, people to, to leave the workforce. So we have to play catch up. And also the pandemic has had a really terrible impact on childcare centers. I know more specifically about the Alberta context, but I, I assume that that's the case across the country. We've seen centers close, we've seen spaces close. So there's a real problem with um, accessibility of affordable, regulated, high quality childcare. Um, and I do want to echo what what Sharon um, has been talking about in terms of the uh, in terms of the wages and uh, value of of um, the the value we place on on early childhood educators. I mean, it's ridiculous to me that um, you know, for example, a, a large equipment operator makes three times the amount that a university educated early childhood educator makes that is ridiculous to me children are obviously a resource or a social resource and we have to you know going back to the the royal commission recognize that it's not just a private responsibility it's a public responsibility because we need to have children we need to raise children well as a society so we have to really change the way we think about about child care unfortunately again coming back to the alberta context uh, we, we, we have, there's an like incredible resistance to uh, a, a new way of thinking about child care as a public responsibility. We have a right wing government that is really, I think, quite invested in reinstalling the um, heterosexual nuclear family with the, the male breadwinner model. And, and so that is causing them to drag their feet, I think, on, on this, um, on, on the child care deal with the, the federal government. Emma's watching right now live on YouTube and she's hearing what the three of you are saying. And she says, ah, that explains why elderly family members keep giving me crap for working. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's kind of a it's like certainly a generational thing. But but the conversation is it's not solved. And if I can just throw an obvious comment out here for your consumption and for your response to Dr. Prentice, maybe we'll come to you first. Isn't it interesting that governments, you know, oftentimes it's, it's interesting to hear different people explain their understanding of the role of government. And for a lot of people, they want to just boil it down to the economy. Right. And don't get me wrong. I understand how this can be a huge part of a conversation about the economy. But when it comes to the so-called social well-being of a society, if you're talking about health policy or education policy, child care policy, what have you, regulations around industry, it requires so much more political will. And I'm not sure. I mean, I know that that's what scares off a lot of governments and a lot of politicians. They're afraid that if they tread into that territory, that they're going to lose their political support. So how significant 
is this one, because the federal government, I haven't really seen to this point, and let's acknowledge that the campaigns haven't started yet, but I've not yet really seen the federal government pin this on social well-being. I've also not seen them really argue that this is an economic driver. It's almost as though the federal government is, is, is noting that they believe that the Canadian public is to a point where this is expected, where this is an, inspect, an expected investment. Well... Um, it depends who you think everyone is. Yeah. I mean, we see very strong gender gaps. I and mean, if you ask women how they feel about this, you get quite different answers than if you ask men. Mm-hmm. And that's because the way we organize family and work life in Canada t- shows us over and over again that the presence or absence of children has way more of a difference on a woman's work life than it does on a man's work life. So it's 2021 and this is still a, a very much a gendered issue. So you, you can't get away from talking about the who of this, but I do think it's primarily being argued as an economic issue. I think that's what we saw in the federal government. I think this is useful, but it immediately leads us then into the different visions of solutions. And I know you asked us, Ryan, not to get into jurisdictional tangles, but it's inevitable. Please do. So there's two ways to do this historically in Canada. You either left children to the care of their private mother in the home, that's, that's been our history, mostly, even though, of course, working class women and many other women always worked. They just were left out of the story. Um, or you, you left businesses, private businesses to do it. And, and then people would use private services. Same way you want carrots for dinner, you go buy carrots at the store. You wanted child care, you went and paid for your child care. Um, so this is going to be one of, I think, the real pinch points for this plan going forward is what's the role of businesses in providing child care for services and what's the role of making them a, a public service where staff are well trained and and um, you know you have entitlements so this I think is the next frontier of the debate because if you're a private business you look at a labor intensive service like child care and the way you want to make it profitable is you want to hire less qualified people. You want to have more child per educator. You think, do they really need a playground? Right. <laughs> um, and you cut your costs and that's how you make profits in child care. And that's where quality suffers. And that's where the early childhood educator workforce suffers. And I think this question about should public dollars be spent on private businesses is also an enormously important question. Federal government said primarily investment is going to be in not for profits. But in a province like Manitoba, we don't have a single publicly owned or operated child care center. Every single child care center or, or facility we have in Manitoba is either owned and operated by, by a not-for-profit parent group, a small number of individual entrepreneurs in their own homes providing family home child care, or, or it's a business. And we need to develop a third model of services, which is where governments of all stripes, whether it's school boards or municipalities or regional authorities or some other mechanism, we make childcare a public service. That's the only way we've made. Let, let's, um, just to pick up on Susan's point, let's be honest. If the market was going to solve the childcare dilemma, it would have done so by now. We wouldn't be in this disastrous mess where so few people can afford, can access childcare and almost nobody can afford it. And there's low wages. If the market was the solution, it would have happened already. We, let's let's remove that from the discussion anymore. We've got the evidence that it doesn't work. Um, now is the time to move forward on building public assets with public money, um, not using tax, not using my taxpayer dollars that I work hard for or yours for somebody else to pay off their mortgage and walk away with a real estate asset at the mm-hmm. end of the day. Let's build long-term public community assets through public delivery and not-for-profit societies. That's how we build a system. We don't need more isolated little businesses where people are trying to, you know, and I hear all the time from um, for-profit operators, well, there's no real profit in childcare. Exactly, that's the point. If there's no profit in it, then let's stop pretending that there is. Uh, Let's stop cutting corners to make a profit uh, and let's do things differently with public money. Dr. Gotell, I see you nodding there and I want to go, but first I want to tee up a tweet that you sent out uh, just a short time ago because I think it also provides some context. Uh, You say leaving a billion dollars of federal funds on the table for $10 a day childcare hurts Alberta families and the province's economy. Hardworking Albertans will leave the province. The rest of us will be paying for affordable childcare programs in other provinces through our federal taxes. I don't have to tell you, there's this kind of like, 
you know, exactly. I, you could probably say small C or even big C conservative idea around. And, and we could debate this all day. And uh, matter of fact, it would probably be a pretty good one. Uh, people will talk about, you know, the premise of how things should be funded. And people might point to something like income splitting as an incentive for families to leave one parent at home. Or they may want to talk about tax credits or that type of thing, as opposed to establishing a well-funded, healthy public system. Do you think, I mean, in my opinion, that's probably one of the biggest barriers here. Number one, I don't think Alberta's premier is inclined to give the prime minister credit for this type of thing. And number two, Alberta doesn't really, and and throughout history, this has been evident. Alberta doesn't really like being told what to do and how to do it by the federal government. There's kind of that sticking point on the prairies, in particular, Alberta. Is this where you think that the pushback or the the lack of action or to this point, the lack of a deal in Alberta stems from? Is Is it the psyche of the province? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that that's part of uh, the problem. I mean, obviously, we, you know, uh, our UCP government is is very much aligned with, um, you know, Stephen Harper's uh, policies and vision, and we all know that the the Harper Conservatives' uh, approach to childcare was to um, to deliver funding through through tax credits to allow parent choice, enable women primarily to stay at home. Um, so that really, yes, it, I'm sure it does. It does influence the uh, the UCP approach, and I mean that's probably the kind of approach that they would like to take. You know, they say all the time, "Well, why should families who make the sacrifice of having a parent, i.e., a woman, stay at home, um, fund through the tax system uh, the the childcare choices of other parents?" We don't, you know, going back to the conversation and the, the points that, that Susan raised around, like, let's move away from economic rationales. We don't talk about, the, you know, public education in these kinds of ways. We don't say, you know, um, because you have decided to homeschool your child, there shouldn't be a public education system at all. We, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't talk about um, public education in that way. We shouldn't be talking about childcare in that way. But yes, I mean, there is that barrier. There is that small C conservative approach, but it, it doesn't work. It, it, it privatizes responsibility for managing, finding uh, childcare. This is a burden that is taken on primarily by women. Uh, we have one of the lowest uh, labor force participation rates for women in the country in Alberta, and one way to boost the Alberta economy, and you know, we're we're talking about diversification and you know, moving beyond oil and gas and so on. But one way we can give the economy a real push is by making childcare accessible. Because if we increase women's labor force participation, it will increase our GDP, and it will in fact pay for the province's investment in. Uh, accessible, affordable childcare. But we have this ideological opposition. And I am very, very afraid that at the end of the day, uh, the, the government is just going to leave this money on the table. And, you know, we're, we're having this huge conversation about equalization and how Alberta tax, you know, taxes are, are funding, you know, services and, and um, uh, you know, the fiscal situation of other provinces. Well, think about how this is going to be. We're going to have a situation where I'm fairly sure most provinces will sign on to a deal with the federal government. And if we're the only province left out, how is that going to impact people's choices about where they might want to work, whether they might want to relocate to Alberta or, say, another province? If I were a young person with children, there's no way I'd choose a province that didn't have the same child care programs that are available in other provinces. But nevertheless, we are going to be paying for those other provinces programs through our tax dollars. So let's get real and let's let's sign on to to this deal it's ridiculous for us to leave this money on the table i i hope that albertans uh and what i mean by that is i hope that voters uh take that seriously lise i mean it's that that's a real thing uh and you know you've got alberta's premier talking about nurses in particular i don't mean to swerve away from the subject matter but i will bring it back i mean you talk about nurses salaries and when he was asked about it and and obviously, we're expecting a bit of a labor war uh, coming up here. He, he just it doesn't. He's, he says, I, I have a hard time believing that anybody's going to leave to go pay a PST and higher taxes somewhere else. Just, that, that just doesn't just is it just absolutely does not believe that somebody would make a decision that would cost them 
you know, paying PST. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's all part and parcel of the same thing, uh, you know, like seeking a wage reduction retroactively from nurses, the devaluation and low pay in the in the child care sector, in the long term care sector. It's about the devaluation of caring work because nursing is often seen in that way it's a feminized profession so yeah i mean this you know all of the jason kenny economic recovery photos if you follow them on twitter feature you know men in hard hats and you know pictures of men <laughs> repeatedly there are very few women in in the in those pictures um recovery um in in this province is, is really being framed as bro recovery that's the the concept that i use but um yeah we have to think about the devaluation of caring work but it, it's a it's a large problem it's a long-standing problem and it has to do with um with uh, gender discrimination and uh, and the devaluation of feminized professions, Doctor Prentice, Ryan, can I, yeah, can please I, do can I jump have in. One, one quick thing, which I think um, uh, when we, I want to get back to talking about what we want here um, and what it what the system is that we we want people to have a vision for, because very few people actually get to experience high quality childcare. So to know what they want to advocate for. And outside of Quebec, there's very little system to advocate for. So I want to make sure that we're giving people the vision of what it is that this this new federal money and provincial money should be purchasing, what they should be advocating for. Um, and I wanted people to think about a childcare system that not only is affordable, with well-educated and well-compensated um, educators in those programs, but also a system that is not just for people who work Monday to Friday, nine to five, a system that actually helps people who support their children if they're on a four day, four day on and off rotating shift, or if they've got precarious work and they only know in the morning if they're going to be working in the afternoon, or if they're going to be working early mornings or late evenings or even weekends. Like, I think we also have to, when we're thinking about that vision of childcare that we're all fighting for, and it sounds like you're fighting more than the rest of us in Alberta. I'm sorry about that. Um, we all are. Let's get, yeah, let's let's make sure that we're helping people understand the vision. This is not just um, for those who are lucky enough to have an office job Monday to Friday. This is about um, supporting all families and all their diversities, culturally safe childcare, welcoming childcare to families, whether they live in rural or remote or urban or suburban communities, the same way we have elementary schools in all those communities, um, we would have childcare programs as well. Let that's me. My, that's my piece. Sam, can you tee up Jim Carr for me? That so sounds this, like a utopia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a well. Let me get. But it's wanna, doable. That's the thing. It's doable. Well, let's it's, let's talk you know, about I'm it. Sure because Sharon, no, I, I don't. that about kindergarten. Sharon, go ahead. So I don't mean to step on your toes. No, I was saying, you know, I, I've heard stories that people had the same fight about kindergarten yeah. um, and primary school that, uh, you know, it was for really poor kids or those who could afford it got the, the good the good version. Um, and and kindergarten and primary school might have looked like utopia at one point for people to public education, public health care might have looked like utopia, um, a universal high quality child care system. For some people looks like utopia, but we are getting so much closer now and it's easier to describe the vision and have people support it. We've got now, you know, literally tens of thousands of individuals in BC who've signed to support 10 a day. We've got 67 local governments who've endorsed the 10 a day plan. More than half our school districts in the province. Our support represents far more now than 2 million British Columbians. So it, when you give people the vision that's concrete, that's achievable, that's costed, um, people buy into it because they recognize the value. I, I, I oftentimes enjoy answering a question with a question. And, and I think that when it gets dumbed down to the point where people say, can we afford this? And the question is, can we afford not to? And I think that that's a conversation that needs to be had. Here, here's, uh, and, and this will tee up where do we need to go from here and how does this need to happen? And obviously there will be different conversations in BC or Alberta or Manitoba or Quebec, obviously, which already has a robust uh, program in place. I asked, I mean, it was in the context of Alberta, as you'll see in just a second, but just a couple of days ago, uh, spoke with the prime ministers. This was on August 4th. If folks want to track down our podcast or find it on our YouTube channel, the prime minister's special representative for the prairies, the honorable minister, Jim Carr, the premier's executive directors uh, of communications uh, Brock Harrison claimed the other day that Alberta was the last province approached by the federal government to try to plot out a plan 
uh, to bring some form of subsidized or affordable child care. Uh, is that accurate? And if so, why? There are conversations happening right now uh, at very senior levels of the government of Canada and the provinces. As you know, we've signed agreements already uh, with several of the provinces. We continue to look at ways in which we can sign agreements with all of them. Uh, the situation is not the same from province to province, uh, but the objective is pretty clear. And I think that it's shared by an awful lot of people in this country. Affordable child care which is not only good social policy, but it's a very sensible economic policy too. And many provinces see it that way. So we'll continue to have these chats. Uh, we don't expect that there's gonna be quick agreement with all the provinces. We've said to Canadians, this is what our ambitious goal is. These are the dollars that we're prepared to invest in achieving that goal. We want the provinces to come with it, with us. And we're having serious conversations right now to see if we can accomplish that. Okay, so that was Jim Carr a couple of days ago. Dr. Prentice, let's start with you. I mean, why do we put this in front of our audience? I mean, what can real talkers do to support or even manifest a $10 a day child care in their province? Well, uh, Jim Carr is my MP, actually. He's from oh. he's from one of He's mine. And uh, he does understand child care. Uh, I will say that there's a there's sort of a lurking issue here that um, maybe you want to talk about, which is that in addition to all the financial promises that were made in the budget, um, the government also dropped this little kind of bomb, which was that they're going to produce national legislation. And I am so curious to see what that looks like, because, you know, this scan of the country, you know, what where Alberta's at, where uh, Quebec is at, where Manitoba's at, where BC is at, it's it's pretty unsatisfactory variation. I mean, you know, Canada's a federation, but we're also a country and we wouldn't be very happy with wild differently access to health care or um, other kinds of services across the country. And yet somehow we have this idea that, you know, each province gets to be so unique, make its own unique, unique little bilateral agreement and can do things completely differently. So, I mean, I don't understand why everyone across the country isn't looking to Quebec and saying they can do it for $8 a day, start it at $5 a day. There's a space for almost every child who needs it. There's almost almost no gap these days between supply and demand. How come we can't have what Quebec has? So I think thinking about some national standards and national access and, and the idea that a Canadian in Alberta should have the same access to quality childcare that a you know person living in Quebec can have, like that's what I think voters across the country should be asking in the upcoming um, federal election and also of their provincial representatives as well. You already know what, you know, in, in particular, what Alberta's premier would say to you, though, in response. Right. You, he would say that you are ignoring the significant uh, importance of provincial autonomy on matters mm -hmm. like education and health. Right. That's exactly what they would say. We will not acquiesce our child care program to the Trudeau liberals who have shown that yada yada. That's exactly where that would go. It's a pretty weird line in the sand to draw. Like, mm -hmm. what do you have against supporting children and families and women and creating more social inclusion and social solidarity and supporting all the children who are going to grow up and make the Canada of tomorrow? Like, what do you have against that? Like, it's a pretty <laughs> indefensible position. <laughs> it's actually, I'm just going to, if the Premier of yeah, Alberta ever agrees gonna, to an I, interview, I, I'm going to clip that. I'm going to clip that and I'm going to put that question <laughs> in front of him. That would ask that in the context of his entire career. Dr. Gotell? Well, I was I was just going to say, though, that if um, the federal government passes regu uh, legislation with national standards, they have to actually be willing to enforce it, too. And, you know, what we've seen with the Canada Health Act is that we do have some national standards they are pretty weak. But um, the, the government, the federal government has not been willing to enforce those standards. So and, you know, I, I'm uh, in another life, I used to teach Canadian federalism. And this is um, a classic example of what is understood to be a very legitimate federal power, which is the use of the federal spending power. That is how we have uh, national social programs like uh, Medicare and the old age pension. And, you know, this is a 21st century example of that. Um, and the federal government, when it invests significant amounts of uh, funding, gets to attach conditions to that. That That's just simply um, the way that this has worked in the past. And this is how we have, as I said, a national Medicare system. It, 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 and so, uh, yeah, this is this is the same thing. And it's not 
illegitimate for the federal government to attach conditions to this funding. And in the case of Alberta, it's absolutely essential because we have seen mismanagement of federal pandemic funding by by this government. So I'm pretty sure that the federal government is anxious to uh, ensure that the the the, the UCP government complies with conditions. I just, I just know, and Lisa, I'm not trying to be glass half empty guy all the time, but I just know that there's a federal election looming. And I know that the provincial government in Alberta will do everything it can to prevent the Trudeau liberals from having that wedge in the door, from having that foot in the door, for having four and a half million Albertans saying, look what they just did. I am going to have access to $10 a day childcare. I know where my vote's going. Yeah, but that can backfire, Ryan, because, you know, in uh, a year and a half, we could well be saying, look, you know, there's there's accessible, affordable child care in every other province. I'm not going to vote for the UCP. Very good point. Let's let's put this. This is these numbers will not be a surprise to any of you three, but I I think our audience would benefit from seeing this. This is uh, uh, these are median monthly costs of care. OK, across the country. And, and, and obviously there's uh, many Canadian cities listed, but right at the top, it's most expensive in Toronto. This is the median cost of care. This is not the most expensive. The median cost in Toronto, just under sixteen hundred a month, fifteen seventy eight a month in Calgary, twelve fifty a month. I was surprised to see Edmonton three hundred bucks below the Calgary's median cost of care, nine hundred and fifty a month in Edmonton, Moncton, a whole bunch of actually maritime uh, urban centers right around that seven hundred dollar mark. Seven hundred sixteen is the median child care cost, daycare cost in Moncton. And then, of course, Quebec City is a bit of an outlier. They have a program in place, et cetera, but one hundred and eighty one dollars. So let me go from the top to the bottom um, and, and we'll put this to you, Sharon, for comment. In Toronto, it's costing you an average a median, let's say, of fifteen hundred seventy eight bucks a month in Quebec City, one hundred and eighty one. This is the same country we're talking about. Yeah, it's exactly as Susan said. Um, if they can do it in Quebec, why can't we do it everywhere else? And I, yeah, I get a little bit tired of people talking about the uniqueness of each province and territory. There are some fundamentals um, that are consistent across the country. We all want to have enough licensed spaces for families who choose childcare on a voluntary basis to be able to access it. We want that care to be high quality, culturally safe, welcoming childcare. We want educators to be well compensated for their important work. We want them to have a good education. We want that childcare to be affordable. Those are some very basic fundamentals that if the federal government's going to attach conditions to, uh, you know, those are, there's no uniqueness between provinces on needing to reach those benchmarks. Um, so if Quebec can do it, and we have always said in British Columbia that we don't look to Quebec as the perfect system, but we can learn from what has happened in Quebec. Where have their successes been about public investment and high quality? Uh, and we can learn from, because they were smart and started doing it in the 90s, and we can apply that learning to the rest of the country. And you know, in, in BC, we've already, we already have over 36,000 children who are, um, whose families are paying $10 a day or less for their childcare. Um, we have, um, commitment to you know many thousands more spaces and the bilateral agreement is really going to make a difference on the ground to BC families. So um, we're we're happy that the bilateral was signed in British Columbia. We were the first ones to sign um, because our government, our Premier Horgan, um, committed to ten dollar a day childcare in 2017. Childcare has been one of the top election issues in the last two elections. All three major political parties here committed to implement. Uh, a quality, affordable childcare system, all of them. Um, so it is what the public expects and demands here. And let's let's remind uh, members of the public, our fellow Canadians that are going to listen to this, uh, that people can make an issue an election issue. You can make issues election issues at your door, at public forums, on social media, by demanding uh, answers and policy specifics from your candidates. I mean, that's the power that people hold. An interesting point. I'm, I'm take, keeping an eye uh, as much as I can on our live chat. This is the audience joining us right now, either streaming on Mixer or, or contributing on YouTube. And uh, Lalazaz says, you know, to be honest, there's a lot of shaming that's done by working moms when you choose to stay home to look after your kids. And Kim responded and said, yeah, you know what? Sometimes moms can be terrible to other moms, but it's a generational legacy tension. Uh, go to work. Don't go to work. Do it all. 
Kim says we are creating new norms and it's still uncomfortable. Anybody want you know, to respond nobody, to that? No, yeah, nobody criticizes a mom who takes her child to grade one and then goes grocery shopping and maybe goes to the gym. Um, right. We don't shame that mom. That's because it's good for the child to be in grade one. Um, and I think we need to start, you know, this is less about um, what women. It's, so let's have a balance between the value of uh, high quality environments, early learning for children and gender equity and empowering women to do what they want to do. Right. This, uh, you know, I, I think that we need to move beyond this shaming of one. You know, every family chooses what's best for them. But let's be real. Child care actually isn't a choice anymore or, or, or still isn't a choice because it's unavailable and unaffordable and often low quality. So sometimes it isn't really even a choice. Um, and I just want to pick up on your former point, Ryan, about you can make something an election issue. Mm. So Child Care Now, which is the National Child Care Advocacy Association of Canada, they now have branches in many provinces. Um, and I would encourage people to, to look up Child Care Now and see how you can um, plug into that. There's an affordable plan for all, which is Canada wide, um, which has the nuances of each province and territory playing out. So look to child care now for some leadership during the upcoming federal election. That's a great reference. And uh, I, I can see already that Sarah Hoyle's the producer of the show is on it, which gives me the confidence to suggest that we'll be tweeting out a link to that from our, <laughs> am I right? Our show's official, she's already doing it. Our show's official Twitter account at Real Talk RJ, if people want to find that link there. And, and of course you can uh, follow our guests on Twitter as well. You just look to the, the link or the tweet that we put out every morning just about a half hour before we go live on air you know if i know anything about conversations like this is that myself as an interviewer will have missed several key and important points and when we all sign off uh some of you may even send me an email and say i wish we would have got to this or i wish we would have talked about that so i want to leave an opportunity uh, before we thank you for your time uh to put something out there if it's whether it's you want to follow up on something or something we haven't yet talked about or maybe even a call to action uh for our audience members uh dr lee scotel why don't we start with you? Yeah, well, I'm going to you know make my um, comments Alberta focused and Alberta specific, but we need to be holding this government to account in these um, negotiations with the, the federal government. I, I I really do think that like using social media to um, to say we need a deal now with with the federal government is is very very important. Um, but yeah, I, I really do think that um, it, you know the 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 government won't conclude these negotiations before the the federal election, and and that's just a sin. But we need to be mobilized in whatever ways we can to try and shift um, the the government's UCP government's approach. Dr. Susan Prentice. Well, since Lee's took up politics and the big picture, I'll zoom in on the small one, right? It's 2021. It's time for men to stand up for this too, right? It's time for dads. I mean, we talk about working mothers in this country. We hardly ever talk about the idea of working fathers. We don't keep data on that. We just call them dads. But it's time for fathers, uh, uncles, grandparents, brothers, men to also say child care matters to me as well. And uh not leave it just to women to to solve this problem. Um, it's a it's a it's an issue for everybody. So I'd like uh, I'd like men to step up more. That's a great point, uh, Sharon Gregson. Last word to you. Well, every province and territory has an organization that's working on childcare advocacy, and in BC, it's the Coalition of Childcare Advocates. Nationally, it's Childcare Now. Um, I think people who care about this issue need to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, need to make this an election issue in the upcoming federal election, need to make sure that whoever is government post-election upholds these bilateral agreements. And child, the child care situation is so bad, one election is not going to fix it. One bilateral yeah. agreement is not going to fix it. This is a even if government tries really hard, it has to, it's probably going to be 10 years at the quickest to get to where we need to go. So in BC, we're in year four. Um, but yeah, this is not going to be fixed overnight. But if you don't want your children and your grandchildren to be having the same chaos that you're experiencing trying to find childcare, then get active. And just because your kids start going to school or even to university, don't stop being a childcare advocate for the generations of women and dads still to come. 
That's Sharon Gregson, provincial spokesperson for the very successful 10 a day, $10 a day child care campaign with the Coalition of Child Care Advocates of BC. Uh, Dr. Lise Gotella, professor of women's and gender studies at the U of A, and Dr. Susan Prentice, professor of sociology at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. We're very grateful for your time, your expertise, and the calls to action. Thanks so much for this. Thanks, Ryan. And thank Bye. you to Real Talkers for the, the comments here. I mean, I, I, I do my best to stay on top of them. Uh, I mean, just so many of you sharing your personal perspectives. And, and I mean, this is great. I, you know, Daniel says there should be no shaming. Everybody's in different situations. And Daniel, I totally agree with you. And also will acknowledge that easier said than done, right? I mean, shaming is also, it's not always like, like you know, on Instagram or on Twitter. There can be shaming, like just the clucking of... Right. Oh, you're. Oh, right. Oh, your kids in care, and you're. Oh, really? Someone else is really. Oh, interest. Oh, we didn't do that. Our family didn't do that. People like you. And and also, I don't want to denigrate families that that did. I mean, the word sacrifice is a huge word, right? Someone will say our family sacrificed so we could have one parent home, and that family probably did. Family probably earned less. One of the one of the families or one of the members of the family in that relationship. And again, here's another heteronormative comment, but it would be mom. It's always mom that leaves the university degree on the table or that leaves the dream of attending university on the table. It's not always we're going to hear from dads. We will hear from dads that will write in. And we appreciate that perspective, too. And they're going to say, you know what? There's a lot of talk about women and moms, but I'm a single dad or I'm a dad that chose to stay home. And there are those circumstances. Statistically, it, 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 the number of women impacted by this absolutely is, is a dominant statistic. But there will be those families that will say we made the sacrifice. So one that was a priority to us. And that's great. And that's your family's choice. There are many other families that will say we don't have that option like a single dad or a single mom or families that are working minimum wage jobs that like must be nice. We would love to, but the word sacrifice, while maybe not inaccurate, can also be a very loaded word. We sacrificed, implying you did not sacrifice or you did not prioritize that or you did not take that step, right? And these conversations can be really divisive and really come across as judgy, like, you know, Troy, a big part of the patriarchy is telling women that no matter how they live their life, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> right? I like that that comment came from Troy, who, again, maybe I wind up with egg on my face, but I'm assuming is a dude. And I think that that's uh, an, an important comment. Like, I, I really appreciated that from from the doctor saying, uh, Dr. Prentice, fellas, let's hear from you. You know, let's let's see some leadership there on that file. Let's, let's not always have, you know, have it have to be women that are advocating for this and banging the drum and trying to draw attention to this. Let's have some men in positions of community leadership or political leadership or otherwise step up and say we're going to prioritize this. I think what is kind of kind of bigger picture is looking at, you know, we the, the drum that's always being banged is the economy, the economy. We yeah. want to make sure that the workforce is healthy. And then we look at birth rates and how are we going to actually have that workforce to build and sustain the economy and birth rates are falling. And when you look at that, we can say that, you know, when childcare is not actually feasible, it is, it, it, it dissuades people from, from having children. Totally. And then you have the affordable, like not having affordable housing. How am I going to, where am I going to live? Where are the kids going to, how, how am I going to have kids? Yeah. I think that, I think we're on pace. I, I've forecasted in about seven and a half weeks, we will have solved all the world's problems. But we got to figure out we're, we're seven start, and a half, starting okay, here. Okay. Starting, okay. I'm starting the clock right now. <laughs> the, uh, what's that thing called that you turn over the, why can't I think of what it's called? Hourglass. The hourglass. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. You know the what egg I'm talking timer. about. The egg, oh, the egg, the egg timer. timer. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> It's a long egg timer. <laughs> it's a long egg timer. This is going to be the It'll, hardest, the hardest boiled egg. Well, then you Hard then you would guarantee that so you bad. don't have a little like the oozy white stuff because I hate the oozy oh, white stuff. Oh, that's the best. Okay, so here's where this is going to divide our uh -oh. audience again <laughs> uh, because it's we, we've we've fought over really dumb things, but they're serious and significant, like raisins, no raisins, what have you. Hard versus soft boiled eggs. Uh, to me, someone bringing and no offense to anyone. Um, but someone bringing a hard-boiled egg into a workplace is one of the nastiest or like pickled eggs or hard-boiled eggs. I just have always seen. But to me, and I recognize that 
it, it actually is disgusting. I recognize. But as a kid, I would ask my parents time and time and time and time and time. We used to have these little egg cups. Yep. And I'd want these soft boiled eggs. Yep. And when I th- I, even I think of them right now, you just light, lightly tap the shell and you take the crown off and there you have it. And it's like little egg soup. And I recognize that it, if you're not into it, it's disgusting. And people will make comments about what it is that you're eating that will turn you off. But to, in my mind, one of life's simple pleasures is a perfectly soft boiled egg. I agree. Wow. But. Of course it is. <laughs> The white part cannot be soupy. It, it's the yolk that needs to not be well, like rock soup, hard. This is my point is the soupy yolk or the soupy white is is part no, of the pleasure. You you're just, wrong. You just can't think too much about what it's all about. No, and, you're then, wrong. and then we're going to have all the all the like, you know, the, the real sort of like, you know, the probably the triathletes among our audience that are probably going to they probably blend six raw eggs every yeah. morning into into their protein shake. Sam, hard or soft boiled egg or feel free to say no eggs at all. No, a big egg person. Uh, for breakfast, soft boiled all the time. Got to have a runny yolk. Got to be able to dunk the toast in it for sure. My man, hard boiled, sliced up in a salad. That's fair that's enough. That's where I'm into hard boiled eggs. Fair enough. I just think it, the the yolk gets to that kind of like it, it, it's just like chewing chalky. On, yeah, it's like chalky, <laughs> and it's like you, it, there's like you left it in there too long. It's it, I'll it's, still eat it. Yeah, well, I mean, sure. If it's on a good salad, all you got to do is you know m- you know mix it up with. Egg All salad sandwich. Stuff. I'm thinking about a Cobb salad right now, a perfect Cobb salad. Um, did you see how I sprinkled in a triathlon mention there real quick? Because it tees up nicely this reminder that the city of Edmonton, Alberta's capital city, will be playing host. This is a huge deal. The World Triathlon Championship Finals are in Edmonton for a third time, by the way, August 20th through 22nd. Edmonton is Canada's triathlon city, producing more Olympians than any other city in Canada, welcoming the best and fittest athletes in the world. Many of these athletes will have been competing in the Tokyo Games, and they'll be heading to Edmonton to compete to ensure safety and distancing. Organizers have set up a very easy-to-use booking system uh, to book your free seats in the prime viewing area. You just need to visit their website at edmonton.triathlon.com. Org. They have stacked the weekend with elite races. Uh, Saturday, August 21st is the huge day. Community events on the Friday and the Sunday book ending it. A variety of events for all ages, all skill levels. Why not plant the seed? I mean, this is something, this is this is the sport that the whole family can do together. Uh, if you're my family, we substitute the swimming for hot tubs. Then we go for a brief bike ride and then we run to the ice cream shop. That's my favorite triathlon. This one's a little more serious, but everybody's got to start somewhere at edmonton.triathlon.org. Sticker shock is looming for many people. I'm nervous. I've not yet received my power bill. Uh, June or July. As a matter of fact, the truth is I probably just am not checking the mailbox because I just know it's going to be enormous. And our partners at Park Power are reminding you this is their frugal Friday note that this is a great opportunity and a great time of year to take a look at your power bill and consider protecting yourself from price volatility by switching to a fixed rate offering. Park Power is currently offering flexible fixed rates for electricity on one and three year terms. You can get your peace of mind, but you are never locked in. You can switch rates or cancel anytime parkpower.ca make sure you use the promo code 2021 real talk to save 70 dollars off your first bill our friends at westworld computers have been in the business independently family owned for more than 40 years i love those stories family businesses that have survived all different kinds of changes in retail trends and the like at westworld.ca right now they have a fully authorized apple service department you can book your appointment with their trained technicians or you can shop their selection they'll ship anywhere Across the country, if you want to pick up, look at that new iMac lineup, just stunning, at westworld.ca. And with our friends at Eden Landscaping, a friendly reminder that, you know, do I say it, that trees are going to start losing their leaves? And is it, is it can I, I mean, I, look. Well, you got to do that well, to us. Well, because we're on the, I mean, all it's going to sneak up on us, and it's just going to, I might as well be the bearer. I'm going to put it this way. It's still beautiful outside, but pretty soon we're going to be back to sitting in our living rooms, looking out the window, going, why didn't I take action on transforming that space? Now, listen, we've still got time to get shovels in the ground. 
But if you'd rather take more time, I talked to Mike at Eden Landscaping. They're already consulting with people for next spring and summer's landscape construction season. It's never too early to start that conversation with the team that has been bringing outdoor spaces to life for more than 20 years. You can find them online. Search some of their uh, beautiful, the customer testimonials, the photos, the proof of performance, you might call it, at landscapeedmonton.ca. Now, we promised that we would get into some more of your emails today. Our inbox has been slammed this week. We appreciate it. Uh, talk at ryanjesperson.com is how you can get in touch with our team. We got an email from Jeff who wrote in and he he titled his subject line job loss and COVID conspiracies. And he had listened to our August 4th show. That was Wednesday's show. He said uh, right around the 31 minute mark of that show, Ryan, uh, you were talking to Professor Tim Caulfield. Yeah, that was a great interview, by the way, uh, kind of the um, he doesn't like being called a myth buster, by the way. I once asked him point blank. I was like, how do you feel about being called a myth buster? He's like, well, I, you know, he, he, he confronts misinformation. He combats myth misinformation, in, you know, myth buster. Maybe he felt like the, the phrase had been trademarked by the TV show. I don't know what it was, but he was on the show and uh, it resonated with Jeff, who said you, you, you read that comment about somebody who lost their job because of COVID-19, and then that had opened the door in their life for all these conspiracy theories. The email we received was from one of their concerned family members. And Jeff says, and then you asked Tim Caulfield if job loss or other losses during the pandemic might cause this, might cause people to go down that that rabbit hole and start to believe that, you know, microchips are being injected into, you know, 5G implications to the vaccine and all this kind of wild stuff. And, and Tim said, yes. And Jeff said, well, I lost my job to the pandemic and I got vaccinated as soon as I was eligible so I could get back to working with other people. Uh, I feel like I'm being held back by people like the guy described in that email who won't get vaccinated because of these conspiracy theories. And it makes me so angry that from Jeff, who just wrapped up his email there, he's just pissed and I don't blame him. I appreciate him sending that email along. Lindsay wrote in not her real name. And she said, you've been talking a lot on Real Talk about the mindset of the unvaccinated population. And and I thought that you might find this of interest. I'm fully vaccinated, but I'm the only one in my house that is of my extended family. My father in law, my sister in law are also vaccinated. My husband is totally against the covid-19 shot for a number of reasons, which obviously impacts both me and our teenage daughters. His family is a conservative voting, small business owners. They've worked hard all their lives. They see bigger corporations getting richer, like the Walmarts and the Amazons. And it looks very unfair to the struggling local people. And and for good reason, says Lindsay. But his opinions are frequently rammed down my throat. Without much respect or care for my thoughts or beliefs, his family shares his ideas and there is no room for debate. They don't believe in masking, quarantine, vaccines, or the majority of prior health measures. They don't openly defy them, but the ranting and and the perpetuating of misinformation feels endless. This is someone commenting about their own family. Lindsay says, our youngest daughter won't tell me if she wants to be vaccinated because she doesn't want to have to take sides. My older daughter appears apathetic. They know where I stand on this. I have no option to keep my kids away from unvaccinated people. They're part of this group. And so we will potentially add to the problem or suffer its effects. It's really an impossible situation to be in. Now, my husband's convinced I've already had COVID. I was very unwell after my mom visited last year. And I suffered seven weeks of night sweats and a chronic cough. And then I lived through months of brain fog. I mean, it kind of does sound like COVID, but not for me to say. Lindsay says our younger daughter had a milder version, and so he now thinks that we're all immune because we've been exposed. Maybe he's right, but I'm not a doctor, and I don't want to assume anything. He thinks I'm a gullible sheep. I think if I'm right, we've helped ourselves in our community. And if he's right, what harm did taking the vaccine do? He's concerned about long-term effects of the shot, and I can appreciate that. But weighing the pros and cons, there's no doubt the pros have it. He also cites numerous articles about kids who've had horrible side effects as a result of the vaccine or have even died. And I hate hearing it, but I don't discount it. When my doctor told me a sad anecdote about a 23-year-old patient of hers who had COVID-19, the example was dismissed. Lindsay says you can't reach people with this mindset. 
I love my husband and I love my extended family, but I can't pretend that the last 18 months have not been incredibly challenging as a result of our obvious differences. There cannot be any resolution in my household. And so here I sit with my fingers crossed that from Lindsay. <sighs> Tough spot to be in that letter, that email. I, I just can't imagine being in that household. What m- must the, the children be going through trying to, you know, balance the parents, not wanting to even talk about whether or not you want to get the vaccine. Cause you feel like you have to take a side between mom and dad. It's like when mom and dad are getting divorced, you got to pick who you want to live with. I mean, that's what it kind of feels like. Yeah. And then it just, it feels dangerous. I'm, I, my heart goes out to our, to that listener. Yeah. And, and, and listen, we, we appreciate these types of emails when you share with us, it, it obviously resonates with us. And, and of course, always we ask at the top of the email, you just let us know if you'd like us to keep your name anonymous for obvious reasons. I wanted to read this one from Carmen. I thought that this could have been one for trash talk, but it's a little bit longer and I got caught. You remember reading Luke's email for trash talk? Was it last Friday or the Friday before? And it was like so long. And by the end I was like, he got, he, Luke sent me a note after Sam. He sends me a note after and he just says, I was impressed. You did the trash talk voice the whole time. I was like, buddy, I was hanging on. I should have <laughs> sent you a case of I was, lozenges. I was doing my best, but about halfway through, I was like, is this thing? Oh my So this is from Carmen, uh, who signs off as a post-secondary instructor and a healthcare worker that used to be proud to be from Alberta. That stuff just punches me in the gut when I read that stuff. Carmen says, I listened to your chat earlier this week with uh, Dr. Shazma Mathani and Dr. Darren Marklin, and I want to say how grateful I am, first of all, for their continued service through this ordeal that's only been made more horrifying by piss-poor management by our current UCP government said I wanted to share something that I posted on my Facebook it's been frighten, frighteningly easy as of late to feel humanity slipping away as I silently wished COVID upon many people refusing to be vaccinated I had to do my own soul searching think, think about that like let me I silently wished COVID upon people refusing to be vaccinated but you I, think, but you think, sorry, just to interject, to, when you think about like Donald Trump and the the idea that uh, he, the reports that have come out is that his case of COVID was way worse than we knew yeah. than it was publicly, but that didn't change his mind. So I'm kind of like, even if someone gets it, do they change their mind? Sure. And I, th- and I think it's just, quite frankly, shitty to wish a disease on somebody. Yeah. Um, and, and Carmen acknowledges that says I did soul searching, right? Uh, To truly decide if I wanted to allow myself to lose both hope and humanity in the face of this. Uh, And I decided that I didn't. And so here's what I wrote. To the Albertans applauding the premier and those that have not been vaccinated, this from Carmen, I'm exhausted from caring more about your friends and family than you do. But I'm going to keep fighting to keep them alive because if I don't, who will? Premier doesn't care about you or them. He proved that by abdicating all responsibility for controlling the pandemic with the public health changes that we heard about about a week ago. It doesn't seem like you do either. Otherwise, a piece of cloth over your nose and two small injections wouldn't be a big deal, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't choose to ignore thousands upon thousands of doctors and scientists worldwide that are telling you how dangerous COVID is. This is the time in the show where the little ones are going to want to put the earmuffs on. Otherwise, you wouldn't be resistant to doing the bare fucking minimum to keep your friends and family safe. But I care. No, really, I do. Do I agree with your politics? No. Do I question your integrity and your intelligence? Yes. Do I question my integrity and intelligence? No. And that's why I will keep fighting to protect them and you, because I recognize that their lives and yours inherently have value and everybody deserves the right to live long enough to learn from their mistakes. Or not, the learning's on you. But apparently keeping them and you alive is on me. And I'm okay with that. I wasn't always. In fact, I lost my empathy for a while. And I really didn't care what might happen to you. And I am ashamed to say this. For a while, I wanted karma to come and bite you in the ass. It's not like you care about my loved ones. So I wondered why should I care about yours? But it's because of how much I care about my loved ones that I decided I needed to care about yours, too. I have enough love to go around. I have enough compassion that I can care about people around me, not just ones that are exactly like me or not the people that believe the same things as me. 
I refuse to put my ideological beliefs above the lives of others. So I am fully vaccinated and I will continue to mask in public and I will continue to share science and evidence based articles in the hopes that I can reach even just one of you. Then the heartache and the frustration and the anger I feel right now will be worth it. Will I still share snarky memes that make fun of you? Yep. I found my humanity again, but I'm still a sarcastic bitch. Will I fight like a demon possessed to defeat this government in two years? Absolutely. I believe in this province, and I believe that there are more people like me than there are like you. People that value the lives of their fellow citizens. So I'm staying, and I'm fighting, and you will not chase me out, because then who will care about your loved ones? That from Carmen. It's a powerful note. I appreciate people putting it out there and saying, hey, I had a shitty attitude about something and I've thought about it and I've processed it. And here's where I'm at now. I mean, that is real talk right there. And then maintaining a sense of humor, still being, you know, still a sarcastic bitch. bitch. (laughs) (laughs) That's like that's like a a social media bio. (laughs) That's a T-shirt. That is a T-shirt. That is, we should trademark that so we can benefit from it more than anybody else. The teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, they wanted me to let you know, as as I have for the last while, that they're not going to deny that across the country, as a matter of fact, around the world right now, if you've been trying to find a Ram pickup or, for that matter, you've been trying to find any truck to pull a trailer to get out into the great outdoors, you know what's going on right now. I mean, people are getting fantastic trade-in values because selection is really low. That's why it's especially significant that the teams at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge have better inventory and always have than the other dealerships across the province, in part because of their size and also, not to be discounted, the fact that they share inventories between the two dealerships. You can check them out online today. You can just link to them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com to browse their inventory or if you have a sales question, as you can see, The pop-up window's right there. They're ready to talk at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Also wanted to remind you that the team at Kubi Energy uh, took part. I mean, they made possible such a feel-good moment for us on Tuesday of this week with positive reflections as as we announced that Joey's Home with the Winifred Stewart Society, the recipients, thanks to the almost 800 real talkers that cast votes on our question of the week, Joey's Home is the winner of free clean energy for the next 30 years or beyond. Guaranteed for 30 years, the net zero solar installation, Kubi Energy has been doing that for people across Western Canada, whether it's commercial, industrial, residential installations. There's even a new agricultural incentive. That's right. If you want to learn more about how you can start powering your farm with sustainable energy and save money with government incentives, check out kubienergy.ca. They've got the details for you today. The team at Local Waste loves to talk trash. They're going to prove it in just about a second or two after I remind you that they have been family owned for a quarter century. They've been taking your phone calls. You refer to them by their first names. When you get in touch with them, Mikkel, Lauren, and Chris, you come to them, you say, hey, guys, listen, as a business, we've not been dealing with you yet. We acknowledge that, but we heard that you're driven by integrity. We've heard you love to work with people. We've heard you're in the business of building relationships. And we've also heard that you'll commit your resources to get us out of a bad contract. If you get in touch with them at localwaste.ca, you'll find out that's exactly what they do. And it's why their business is growing at the pace it is across Alberta and Saskatchewan. More details at localwaste.ca. Now, the proof of how much Local Waste loves to talk trash comes in the form of this feature, which we present every Friday to wrap up our broadcast week. A chance for you to blow off a little steam, a little something we call Trash Talk! All right. Coming up a little bit later on in Trash Talk, the first ever submission from two dogs. That's right, two dogs had their paws pounding the keyboard, and we'll get to that in just a second. But first, this from Darlene, who says, Jess, but we've been watching the Olympics. we got locals participating, so it's much more personal. Uh, Kira Christmas is from our town, High River, and Finley Knox from Okotoks, Alberta. People on social media have been so negative about these Olympics to the point where they're taking rude and crude pot shots at individuals. Now, I know there's some controversy around 
around these games. So why are the athletes becoming the targets? Getting to the Olympics is a big deal. Think about the odds they've overcome. A friend of ours has a daughter who plays with the women's seven rugby team. Kiara Wardley, the youngest member of the team, and she deserves to be there. People cheered for her when she scored goals. Then she got seriously hurt. We were horrified to see it happen. Her family devastated. They felt helpless. Now, these same social media spaces where people were all supportive, no response to Kiara's injury. What, not a big deal? Happens all the time? Are we that desensitized and distanced we can't relate? I couldn't even find decent follow-up on her injury. Now, I know from family members what happened, but where's the media on this? This is just what happens? Fickle fans, fickle media, seriously, using words like failure and losers during broadcasts and in follow-up seems unsupportive to me. That from Darlene. How about this one from Danielle who says to Dr. Hinshaw in Alberta, that apology is not an apology. You're talking about anger from some people. There are hundreds and hundreds of Albertans protesting against this united, corrupt government every day in Calgary, Edmonton, and Red Deer. You say you're not a bad Abandoning Albertans. We've gone for 18 months. You've been telling us to wear masks, wash hands, social distance, not socialize at Christmas. Now you're saying, along with that Rottweiler Tyler Shandro, that it's all based on science? Pray, says Danielle. Give us the facts. We can take them. The number of cases is up. The number of hospitalizations is up. Epidemiologists and doctors around the world warning us against the Delta variant, but we're okay in Alberta in the pudgy little hands of our fearless leader. My son has Crohn's. Vaccines will not protect him. No antibodies. Zero. I hope you won't be responsible for grave illness or death, but I wouldn't be surprised. Living in fear, signs off Danielle in Alberta. Not of syphilis, not of the flu, but of the Delta variant and being the victim of that little dictator from Ontario who hides behind your skirt. That from Danielle. I checked with Sarah. She said it's okay if I read that as long as it came from a woman. Check. (laughs) And finally, this is one of my favorite Twitter accounts in the entire world. Bunsen Burner BMD. You know Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs? Unbelievable account. They said, Jespo, you might appreciate our COVID analogy. We're not sure if it's a good fit for trash talk, but anyway, I looked at it. It's a great fit for trash talk. Here they are, the pups woofing in. COVID spread takes time. Let's say 50% of people, a low vaccination rate, just stop picking up dog poop at a dog park. To start with, you don't notice it. There's tons of space and and very few poops. Where is all the poop, people say? What's the worry? But days go by. 50% of people still still leaving poops. Now, some people have protected their feet by wearing rubber boots. This is where it gets totally fucking disgusting. The 50% not picking up poop are wearing sandals. Now, more days go by, and now there's poop everywhere. Everyone's stepping in it. Sandal people are getting it between their toes. Now, sorry, everybody. Now, some sandal people have blisters or sores, and ooh boy, with all that poop, do their feet ever get infected? The poop changes, and it's now super nasty, sticky, and clingy. Now, boot people are tracking the poop everywhere, too. Boot people don't know they're covered in poop because they're protected. Now, to make matters worse, some sandal people refuse to see the poop, claiming it's all part of the big poop bag conspiracy. Now, that doesn't stop them from getting covered in poop and getting sick. Disease takes time to spread. Pick up the poop. Wear the boots. Get vaccinated. Hashtag science. That from Bunsen and Beaker with easily the most disgusting and accurate trash talk analogy of all time. You can reach us at talk at ryanjesperson.com or via our hashtag RealTalkRJ. Have an absolutely incredible weekend. We'll talk to you again live on Monday. Next week on the show, Andre Picard, health writer for the Globe and Mail. The battle over nurses' wages. We'll review our question of the week. You can answer it right now at ryanjesperson.com on health measures. And of course, positive reflections coming up on Monday. We'll see you then you beauties. Have a great weekend.